uh, final lecture of the afternoon. We are very, very pleased to have J.D. Conley back with us. He has been a frequent guest of this lectureship for various reasons. One is he always does a wonderful job in, in delivering the message. Uh, J.D. is a very important fellow to me personally. He became very close to my dad in some of his final years. I know dad was so very fond of him and his family and had such respect for his work. Uh, J.D., after graduating from the Brown Trail School, uh, preached in, he's been in three places, at Spencer, at Elkins, and, and now for many years in Harmer Hill. Uh, he tends to kind of stay where he goes for a good little bit, and I think that probably speaks well of him. And he also is a great reminder to us of an ongoing legacy by somebody else that was awfully important to me and a few other people around here. And that, of course, was his father-in-law, who was such a, such a presence in this building and in this area. But J.D. is his own man, his own preacher, and uh, we expect him to have wonderful words for us. J.D. Thank you, Brother Dan, for those kind words. I really appreciate them. But most of all, I appreciate you not looking over and saying, well, I hope J.D. Conley's not preaching today. <laughs> you would have been disappointed. It is always a distinct honor for me to appear on this great lectureship. And I extend my sincere thanks to Brother Andy and the lectureship committee and the good elders of this good church for the invitation to be here this afternoon. I'm also delighted that this lectureship has now provided a complete study of the book of Psalms. And it is my hope that this rich set of books will help many needful souls. And I also appreciate very much the work that Brother Kenny has done and putting out the lectureship book and making it available to us all, and we are grateful to him for that. As I began my research for this assignment, I was immediately informed that several Bible scholars were not hesitant to state that Psalm 68 is one of great difficulty. For example, Adam Clark says, I know not how to undertake a comment on this psalm. It is the most difficult in the whole Psalter. So thank you forever, whoever assigned this to me. <laughs> Many more fell in line with that assessment. So as a result, this difficulty has led to many different interpretations causing me to feel most inadequate in an attempt to provide clarity on these 35 verses. So here at the outset, I plead with you to forgive my feebleness as I attempt to provide what I can by way of explanation. The title given to this lecture series is Elevating My Lord and is largely focused on the Messianic Psalms. Now most scholars agree that Psalm 68 has Messianic undertones, or either it's altogether Messianic. And after my study, I've concluded that it is by and large Messianic in scope. It appears to allude to not only Christ the Savior, but His ascension and His kingdom. But as we navigate through this psalm, we're going to exercise caution not to make everything messianic. The notion to do so may tug us in that direction because there seems to be a lot in these verses that possibly could be messianic. 
You know, no doubt we were aware that when we read through the Old Testament, suddenly the Holy Spirit gives the scribe words that launch out into a soaring prophecy concerning the Christ or His kingdom. And here in Psalm 68, that same type of inspiration is seen in verse 18. Yet there's a sizable portion of this psalm that may be devoted to the Messianic, other than just verse 18. Now concerning the authorship of Psalm 68, it is none other than the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Whereas the inspired writer is widely believed to be David. There is little, if any, question about that. So as we undertake this messianic approach to the study of these verses, I will just mention there are seven different names ascribed to God in this psalm. And you'll look and you'll see that they're listed in the book. And all seven forms are speaking of the same divine person, and that being the Messiah. So these names either denote references to Christ, or they convey the Father's allusion to His Son in prophecy, or in the instrumentality of the events transpiring at that time in history. The overriding message of this psalm is the victory of the Lord over His enemies. And the two most prevalent ideas regarding its background is either the exodus of God's people from Egyptian bondage or the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David being ensconced in the sanctuary following one of Israel's battle victories. So taking these two opposing views of interpretation into consideration it sets forth a haze of ambiguity. And thus we can see why this psalm is regarded as one of the most difficult to interpret. And these two views are not the only head scratchers contained in this psalm. Be that as it may, regardless of the historical setting, the theme is the same. Namely, the Lord is triumphant. Victory belongs to Him alone, which in turn qualifies Him to be our Savior. As Paul penned, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 68 is a song, whereas some of the songs are prayers, this one is a hymn. And it is called a psalm in the superscription. And since songs have verses called stanzas, the structure of our study is going to be divided into seven stanzas. My assignment is, the Lord is Savior. Therefore, this particular psalm, though fraught with difficulties, can simply be called a song about our Savior. First stanza, as Savior Christ is on the way, verses 1 through 6. What a wonderful hope springs from these lilting lyrics. Perhaps David begins this ode with a shout, exclaiming, let God arise. Question, is this a petition of faith he makes, or is he being prophetic? Either way, the request is meant to be understood. It will come to fruition. Is this rising up a call for God to let his enemies be scattered and flee at his presence? Or could it be a veiled reference to the ascension of Christ in verse 18? Or could it be an allusion to his resurrection from the dead? Or to his incarnation, which is sometimes called a raising of him up, as in Acts 3 and Acts 13? Or could it mean both? It's this murkiness of interpretation that lends difficulty to the meaning of this psalm. Whether then or now, God retains the power to scatter and obliterate our fiercest of enemies. No opponent is so strong or brave to stand against him. Romans 8.31 When the Savior is by our side, Psalm 16.8, our enemies take on 
the flimsy consistency of smoke and are dissolved into a puddle of wax. Verse 2. Though the world turns against us with sound and fury, our Savior will stand with us and strengthen us. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 17. Verses 3 and 4 inform us that knowing we have such a Savior as our Lord should fill us with jubilation and extol Him that rideth upon the heavens by His name Jah and rejoice before Him. Verse 4. Jah is an abbreviation of the name Jehovah. Spurgeon noted that it is not a diminution of the name, of that name, but an intensified word containing in it the essence of the longer august title. Gill states, Jah was a name given to Christ and shows him to be the Most High, a self-existent being, the immutable and everlasting I Am, which is and was and is to come. Verses 5 and 6 had another comforting characteristic to the Lord as Savior. His greatness is not limited to military victories, but is also seen in His compassion for the orphans and widows. Christ our Savior provides what His people need. His tender arm and touch reaches over into the Christian age. James chapter 1 and verse 27. Now some Christians, for the sake of Christ and the gospel, have been abandoned. They have been deserted by their friends, even by some of their family members, and in a spiritual sense, have become fatherless and homeless. And yet Christ is the father of such and will have pity and meet their every need. Now regarding the coming of Christ, you remember that Isaiah called him the everlasting father. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. He did not mean God the father, rather Christ would be the father of eternity. Verse 6 declares, God setteth the solitary in families. How sad that so many live their lives without any connection whatsoever to family. With FaceTime and Skype and texting and social media, it is easier than ever before to maintain family ties. There's no excuse for a lack of communication. But we know that these ways cannot rival seeing our loved ones in person. Distance makes our gatherings rare. The miles that separate prevent us from seeing our loved ones as often as we'd like. And that becomes a burden to bear. But can you imagine the poor soul who has no one who are literally speaking solitary. Verse 6. All alone with no one to be with. The good news is the Lord is our Savior can make a family for them. Just read Mark chapter 10 verses 29 and 30. Not only that, He can loose the prisoner from his chains. Literal fetters and chains could not prevent him from freeing Peter from prison. And the spiritual shackles of sin are no match for our sovereign Savior either. Matthew 1 and verse 21. The sixth verse ends declaring, But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. Speaking of dry land, I have a dry mouth. Let me pick up my bottle of water that I knocked over here. All right, that's better. Therefore, anyone who refuses to obey Christ is not going to fare well. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 9. Now, contextually, the rebellious may be a prophetic glance toward the Jews. 
Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 6. The majority of them, we know, outrightly rejected and reviled the Savior, their own Messiah, John chapter 1 and verse 11. Ultimately, they murdered him upon a cross in the most heinous way. And consequently, in the year A.D. 70, their house was left unto them desolate at the cruel hands of the Roman army. And when Titus destroyed Jerusalem, he burned the temple, thus incinerating all the genealogical records. The Jews today could not tell you what tribe they came from if their life depended on it. Indeed, Christ as Savior is depicted as on the way in the first stanza. Second stanza, as Savior, Christ clears the way, verses 7 through 10. Now, by use of the word Salah beneath verse 7 is a reminder that this psalm is a song that is being sung. And this is the first of three occurrences. The other two are seen in verses 19 and 32. And this is an interesting and inspired word and should be read when we read through the Psalms. In fact, it occurs 71 times in the Psalms, three times in the book of Habakkuk. What does Salah mean? It's a musical pause that's interjected into the song for the purpose of meditating over what has just been sung. Some have likened it to Amen or Hallelujah. Clark says Salah means this is truth. And by use of this term, David wants all his readers to contemplate on the sublime fact that God, Christ, led and cleared the way for his people in their march out of Egypt. He was with them every step of the way. And he is Savior now as he was then. He has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we might boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Verse 7 appears to be a backward reference to the exodus of physical Israel as they marched out of Egyptian captivity toward Canaan habitation and liberation. We know that Christ paved the way before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. God is Jah, the divine second person of the Godhead. He was the harbinger who cleared the way, shielding the Israelites from harm, and Christ absolutely protected and provided for his children. He met their every need and did so in abundance. When they were out there that 40 years wandering around on that hot sand, their feet didn't even swell. Their sandals, their clothes never wore out. Evidently, God intervened in this situation and suspended howbeit in a narrow, confined way, suspended the law, the second law of thermodynamics. He provided water out of rocks, manna from heaven, a virtual sea of quail, and a wonderful snake bite remedy, which was theirs for simply looking at the brass serpent on the pole. Now they had to go and they had to look at it. They couldn't just think about it or envision it in their minds, they had to go and look upon it. Then and only then were they healed from their snake bite. The news of God's glorious works spread because verse 8 says the earth shook. Not just literally as he made his presence known from Sinai's summit, but the earth may have metaphorically vibrated when the inhabitants of the earth heard of the wonders that God had performed for his people. As Christ worked at clearing the way through the wilderness of sand, he also works for every man and woman through the wilderness of sin. As Savior, he escorts us through the labyrinth of evil and delivers us to the gleaming shores 
of glory. Christ has marched through the parched desert of the pagan world, proving to all, including the callous Jews, that he is the Messiah and has blazed a path to heavenly Canaan. And this second stanza closes with another possible New Testament hint. Does the word congregation in verse 10 refer to physical Israel dwelling in the promised land of Canaan or to spiritual Israel inhabiting the Lord's church? Either way, the Lord is Savior of both. Third stanza. As Savior Christ leads the way, verses 11 through 14. This quartet of verses is described by one Bible scholar as the despair of commentators. Perown says, it is indeed almost hopeless now to understand the illusions. Nevertheless, what this foggy stanza depicts, according to Rotherham, is a battle with the battle left out. And other commentators agree. Gray and Adams say the word, the fiat, for attacking the foes on taking possession of Canaan, God's word is sovereign. He has only to command, and the victory is won. So at the moment of divine utterance, the victory was either assured or given. So this demonstrates that the power behind the creation, both physical and spiritual victories, and the gospel itself is the omnipotent word of the Savior. Enemies flee from his presence. They scatter in his wake. Even the kings of Canaan, along with their entire armies, ran when the Lord's command was handed down leaving everything to be dispersed as spoil. And Christ is still leading the way through the wilderness of sin by the light of the gospel. Concerning verse 13, Rotherham states, it is extremely difficult to understand, indeed the most difficult in the Psalter. Well, let's read verse 13. Though ye have lain among the pots... Yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove, covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. The new king James has, though ye lie down among the sheepfolds. Other versions have similar renderings. Which is it? Well, I can only speculate. My speculation is that because the new king James and many other more modern versions have the latter, that may be an indicator of the more correct rendering of this verse. But what do these renderings mean? Now the King James Version evidently means even though God's people have been cast aside like a soot-covered broken pot, useless and ugly, due to their captivities, they nevertheless will be made beautiful, glorious, and useful once more, meaning peace, freedom, and prosperity will once more be granted unto them. But the consensus translation in the New King James and American Standard and others, though you lie down among the sheepfolds, seems to refer to the humble circumstances of God's people. But both renderings assure God's people that regardless of how harsh and bleak the circumstances of life are, there are beautiful and brighter days ahead. Nowhere is this more clearly seen than in the church age. Before the Savior arrived with his redemptive report, it can be said that all of mankind was doing what? Lying among the pots. We were broken into shards. We were caked with the black soot of sin. That was our deplorable condition before our conversion to Christ. Considering the other wording of verse 13, we were but lowly sheep in constant need of the good shepherd to lead us through the dangerous pastures of life. As helpless sheep, we dare not lie down in the fields of the world or wander off the path that he has forged. The Savior will see to it that the loyal sheep will be richly rewarded when this pilgrimage is over. 
Salvation from sin will give us flight as if we were on the silver and gold encrusted wings of a dove. Verse 14 is simply a magnification of God's almighty power. In fighting for his people, he scattered kings and caused utter destruction. In fighting for his people, he did that. But it's been suggested that the snow and salmon refers to their bleached bones which were strewn and covered the mountainsides. Salmon is a reference to Palestine. And thus, this third stanza underscores that since the Lord is Savior, he necessarily is the victor who leads us to the way of triumph. Fourth stanza, as Savior Christ blesses the way, verses 15 through 18. These are the sweetest verses in the song David sings. The song reaches its crescendo in these melodic lyrics. God's people are now the envy of their defeated enemies because the battle is won and the conqueror marches into Zion and lays claim on his royal residence. And Zion here is contrasted with the towering peaks of Mount Hermon on the outskirts of Bashan at 9,000 feet above sea level. And even though Mount Zion is only a few hundred feet in elevation, verse 15 is obviously using figurative language. And this is done to put a heightened spiritual prominence on Jerusalem with its temple. Verse 16 shows how the other mountains seem to be filled with envy and they throw a tantrum by leaping up and down like a spoiled child. And even though Mount Zion was a molehill by comparison, it was the mountain God chose. The Lord chose Zion over Bashan with its dizzying heights. Has he not often chosen the small and weak over the big and strong? Verse 17 further emphasizes the Lord's overwhelming strength. The Lord has unlimited power at his beck and call. Innumerable angels stand at the ready to be utilized as he sees fit. You know, Israel never had many chariots. They didn't need them because God fought for them. And the verse ends by a look back to the past, namely Sinai, and a reference to the present as seen in the holy place that is Zion. The events that transpired in between are skipped over and emphasis is put on these two places, more precisely the events that took place at both of these locations. So this musical history lesson on mountains, which David gives us, segues into the next verse, which talks about ascension. And mountains are a theme mentioned often in Scripture. Our Savior ascended back to heaven from the Mount of Olives. And it is this ascension that is prophetically brought forth next. Verse 18 is the climax of this psalm. It is the fulcrum on which this song is balanced. This canticle rises to its glorious zenith with undisputed messianic information. It is here that David peers through the prophetic telescope and writes these wondrous lyrics. Now in the context, David has in mind God's victory in battle over Israel's enemies and its ensuing results. In what ways did God deal with his defeated enemies? He led captivity captive and he received gifts from men. By his victory, the Lord received tribute and submission from his conquered foes. These gifts proved his complete ownership of the land and his control over the people. This supported the truth mentioned at the end of the verse, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Regarding this verse, Spurgeon said, the expression is emphatical. He has conquered and triumphed over all the powers which held us in captivity so that captivity itself is taken captive. Does that not underscore the glorious salvation that we have and we enjoy in Jesus Christ? 
that it's the captivity of sin itself has been taken captive. How shall we, how could we escape so great salvation? Only by neglect on our part, Hebrews 2 3. Later on in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, Paul quoted verse 18 and applied it to Jesus. He kept the context, but he changed one key word. Paul wrote, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. The apostle applied this to the ascension of Christ into heaven and his sending of the Comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, John 16, 7. The Holy Spirit then endowed the twelve in the early church with the miraculous spiritual gifts. These spiritual gifts qualified men for the gospel ministry. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Christ received these gifts from the Father, then He in turn gave them to men in a remarkable fashion on the day of Pentecost. Acts 2, 1 through 4. Acts 2, 38. The divine record goes on to inform us that there were several eyewitnesses to the ascension of Christ. These reliable eyewitnesses were comprised of both the apostles and angels. Acts 1, 9 through 11. Because of the certainty of the ascension of Christ, David expresses this event in the past tense, even though its fulfillment was yet centuries into the future. There is no question that Christ has laid captive those matters that in the past held us in bondage, such as sin and Satan and the world and death and every spiritual enemy whom Christ overcame. No victory could be more complete. Even those who were rebellious, Christ has made it possible, even desirable, for them to yield service to Him. Truly the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Most assuredly, Christ has blessed the way. Fifth stanza. As Savior Christ maintains the way, verses 19 through 23. So this beautiful song now enters its second half with stupendous praise for our Savior's uncanny love and care for us. Verse 19 states, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Now you might think that verse 19 fits nicely into the last stanza regarding God's blessings. However, the words with benefits from the King James Version being italicized are not in the original. The American Standard Version and several others have Blessed be the Lord who daily beareth our burden, even the God who is our salvation. So these renderings, they seem to be quite different, but they're more often alike than not. In order for the Lord to be loaded with our burdens, He must first lift them off of us and bear them Himself. And so our Savior saves us from the struggles of life that we carry down here. And that's a tremendous blessing He offers us. David's lyrics, Blessed be the Lord, ought to issue from our lips on a constant basis. How could we ever hope to be saved apart from a Savior like our Lord who daily, constantly, and tirelessly, and happily, without complaint, carries the burdens of our lives on his shoulders. Even though the King James Version gives a faulty translation of verse 19, it is nonetheless true that the Lord blesses us daily with benefits. Verse 19 ends saying, even the God of our salvation, Christ is the author of temporal spiritual and eternal salvation, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, and as such, he is qualified to maintain our way to heavenly Canaan. And verses 20 through 23 concur. He has charge over death as well as our salvation. He holds both the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the keys of hell and death. Keys represent authority. 
of which Christ has all. Matthew 28, 18. The phrase, unto God the Lord belongs to issues from death, may indicate he has his various ways of bringing death. After all, he sent the flood. Both the Old Testament and New Testament show various ways in which people met death, some pleasant, many not. And those that the Lord chooses not to die, he wounds. Verse 21. Now this hairy scalp trespasser in verse 21 is probably a reference to a hardened criminal who strikes terror into his victim by his wild, unkempt appearance. Verse 22 is a reminder that no one can hide from the omnipresent God, whether it be on soaring mountain peaks or in plunging ocean depths. And the gory language of verse 23 harkens the mind back to the grisly demise of wicked Queen Jezebel as her body hit the pavement in Jezreel. And so while Christ our Savior maintains our way to celestial glory, this stanza ends on a terrifying down note of eternal damnation in the nether realm for all those who reject His way. Sixth stanza. As Savior Christ is the best way, verses 24 through 27. So with conviction, we tune our lips to seeing that living for Christ is the best way for all people to spend life's little day. We cling to this truth because we, as spiritual Israel, have seen, as did physical Israel, the goings of the Lord, verse 24. The Lord is declared to be the fountain of Israel, verse 26. He is the source from whom all blessings flow. Verse 27 mentions little Benjamin with their ruler. And though Benjamin was the youngest and the smallest tribe, Benjamin nonetheless ruled over them all through Saul the Benjamite. And yet this verse goes on to show that all the tribes honored the Lord. But is Christ not worthy of our praise? Has He not shown us His goings while He was here in the flesh and dwelt among us? Did He not die for us while we were yet sinners? Romans 5 and verse 8. All this and much more proves the Lord is Savior. Therefore, He must be the best way. And the seventh stanza, as Savior Christ is the only way, Verses 28 through 35. Not only is Christ the best way, He's the only way to heaven. John chapter 14 and verse 6. He's the world's only Savior. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Verse 28 says, Thy God hath commanded thy strength. God infused His Son with not just strength, but with strength for a purpose. Divine strength first issued out of Zion. Psalm 110, Acts 2. Eventually the entire world was blanketed with the gospel. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Colossians 1 and verse 23. This divine strength is in the gospel, which is God's power to save. Romans 1, 16. David desires his enemies to experience the vanquishing power of God as he had shown in the past. He then states in verse 29, because of thy temple at Jerusalem. That is, out of respect for it. You remember David wanted to build a temple for the Lord, but the Lord wouldn't permit him to do it. Here, David envisions it completed. The building site had been purchased. The Ark of the Covenant was enshrined in the tabernacle, awaiting the time when Solomon's temple would be a reality. Now some scholars have assigned a Church of Christ angle to thy temple at Jerusalem. It's also contended that kings bring presents unto thee and that the presents are kings having been converted to Christianity. Is that plausible? Maybe. Although Brother Kaufman says, David's prophecy was fulfilled and that Herod spent millions of dollars on the golden doors of that later temple. Now the animals of verse 30 are the two-legged kind, describing the hostility of kings who opposed God's people. The bulls were the leaders, the calves were the followers. In the American Standard Version, 
Then the verse 30 has, trampling underfoot the pieces of silver, reminding us that God despises the tribute of wicked people. God wants our hearts, money, even large amounts that's given with no heart or with the wrong attitude displeases the Lord. He's not going to be appeased by that. Verses 31 and 32 portray a migration toward the Lord in perhaps two Jerusalems, and namely the earthly and the heavenly. Regarding the heavenly Jerusalem, Egypt and Ethiopia could be a reference to the conversion of the Gentiles to the gospel. Since Christ has made the way to heaven possible for all people, he's worthy to be praised. Verse 32. In the last three verses, his divine strength is once again highlighted. He is portrayed as riding upon the heavens of heavens, coupled with the exclamation of his mighty voice. Such language denotes Christ is conqueror. Verse 34 urges us to recognize his omnipotence and worship him due to that undeniable fact. And this majestic hymn ends by emphasizing the Lord's awesome power and the knowledge that he infuses us with his power. May this glorious truth move us to shout out with praise and thanksgiving the last three words in this last stanza. Blessed be God. And though this psalm is rife with difficult meanings, obscure interpretations, and an uncertain background, the overall meaning and message is crystal clear. The seven stanzas unmistakably declare that the Lord is Savior, and as Savior, He came, He cleared the way, He leads the way, He blesses the way, He maintains the way, He's the best way, and He's the only way to heaven. How much of this psalm is messianic cannot be known now, but hopefully... We shall one day be blessed to hear the Lord our Savior give us a full explanation. What a glorious time that will be. This afternoon, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you've never given your Lord your name in life over to the Lord as Savior in your life, then come and meet Him on His terms by believing in Him to be Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Be willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. If we can help you in this matter or in any other, please come now as we stand and sing.